So good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you on behalf of uh, CU Summer University and CU Center for Religious Studies. This is the fourth lecture within the framework of our Summer University course on religion and realism in political thought. Before I introduce our distinguished speaker, Professor Avi Mansfield, let me express my gratitude uh, to our sponsors, first of all, the Budapest Office of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, which is kindly supporting this uh, Summer University course. Now, this event today was made possible by a very generous donation from uh, Mrs. Uh, Linda Nolane from the United States. Um, Mrs. Nolane is a very <coughs> remarkable lady in many respects. I don't want to go into details but she is also a very special donor who only supports scholars that she finds herself interesting and we are in the fortunate situation that Professor Mansfield is one of them. Uh, Mrs. Nolay unfortunately cannot be here today, but we promised to document this lecture on video for her so she may enjoy uh, Professor Mansfield's lecture at home. So before we start, please uh, give an applause to Mrs. Nolay. Now, it is our honor and privilege to have with us today Professor Hobby Mansfield. Hobby C. Mansfield is the William R. Cannon Jr. Professor of Government at Harvard University. And about his academic CV, we may say that he is more of a Harvard scholar than anyone else alive. He first came to Harvard as a freshman in 1949. He has received his AB and PhD from Harvard. He, in 1962, he has joined Harvard faculty, and he is still there today, which means that he has been teaching Harvard students for more than half a century. Professor Mansfield's primary fields of interest is political philosophy. He has written on Edmund Burke and the nature of political parties, on Machiavelli and the inter invention of in indirect government, in defense of a defensible liberalism, and in favor of a constitutional American political science. He has also written on the discovery and development of the theory of executive power. And very, important for, very important for us. He has translated three books of Machiavelli's and with the aid of his late wife, Tocqueville's Democracy in America. Among his recent books are A Student Guide to the Political Philosophy from 2001, the much debated book on manliness from 2006, and Tocqueville, a very short introduction from 2007. Now, Professor Mansfield is not only an outstanding scholar who has received many awards for his teaching and writing, which I will not list now, but he has also been a very outspoken participant in many public debates, for instance, on questions of higher education, gender equality, affirmative actions, and so on. I don't want to go into the details, but Professor Mansfield has often taken a position which was so far off the mainstream, and at the same time so well argued that real debates emerged. I don't want to say that he was always right, but he was certainly always very interesting. Professor Mansfield once said that people may not be totally wrong in calling him a conservative. However, what I always understood to be Professor Mansfield's most important message was something beyond questions of conservatism and liberalism, left or right. And this message simply says that the political world in particular, and the human world in general, is not a reality that can be quantified by methods of mathematics and statistics. The modern and presently dominant mode of political science, therefore, is not necessarily wrong in all respects, but highly limited in its perception and understanding of political reality. And as we think, this was more than a good reason to invite him here as a teacher for our course. The topic of today's lecture is Tocqueville on the Alliance of Religion and Liberty. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Howard Mansfield. Uh, I'm going to talk about Tocqueville, and 
his Alliance of Religion and Liberty, and begin by a quotation from his old regime and the revolution. Uh, and he says, uh, I stop the first American whom I meet, and I ask him if he believes religion to be useful to the stability of laws and to the good order of society. He answers me without hesitation that a civilized society, but above all, a free society, cannot subsist without religion. Those least versed in the science of government know that, at least. And that's from the, as I said, from the old regime, his later book. Alexis de Tocqueville was a liberal, but, as he once said, a new kind of liberal. For us today, no feature of his new liberalism is more remarkable than the alliance between religion and liberty that he sees in America and proposes to be imitated wherever it can in every free society. In liberalism today, there is a debate over the question whether liberal theory needs or should avoid a foundation. Tocqueville seems to take the anti-foundational side. He never mentions the state of nature, the standard foundation of 17th century liberalism, and in democracy in America, he omits any reference to the Declaration of Independence with its ringing foundational assertion that all men are created equal. Yet, if he avoids laying a foundation in reason, he also thinks that religion is essential to political liberty because of the, quote, certain fixed ideas that it offers to ground the practice of self-government. These are doctrines of faith, since for Tocqueville, religion means really revealed religion not a rational or natural religion. These doctrines, however, include articles of reason encompassed in faith. Tocqueville was also a strong opponent of divine right in politics, and a strong proponent of the separation of church and state. Although he praised the Puritans highly as being the point of departure for democracy in America, he criticized its theocratic character. Personally, he seems to have suffered a crisis early in life when, as he recounts it, he came upon the books of 18th century materialists in his father's library and promptly lost his faith, as far as we know, never recaptured, not only in religion, but in, quote, all the truths that supported his beliefs and his actions. Questions arise that are still with us. What does Tocqueville hold against the introduction of foundational principles in democratic politics? And how can they be kept out? What is the relationship between philosophy and religion, given the hostility of modern philosophers, particularly the French philosophes, in uh, to religion, and his desire to make an alliance between the two? Just what essential support does religion supply to political liberty? the essential liberty, according to Tocqueville, so that, despite the separation of church and state necessary to political liberty, he can say that religion, quote, should be considered the first of the Americans' political institutions. To see how Tocqueville understands religion, one must look to his view of mores. For in Democracy in America, his main discussion of religion he first treats religion as the most important of mores, mores of mœurs, in French, defined as the whole moral and intellectual state of a people, comprise both morals and customs. The definition comes from, quote, the ancients, he says, and is related to the ancient emphasis on virtue in human affairs. But it is virtue understood as typical, ordinary, or average, so that modern thinkers who seek laws or rules of social behavior, such as Montesquieu and Rousseau, could find the concept useful and congenial. Mores are connected to another newer concept of the social state, ita social, the product of the fact and of the product of fact and laws, or the two united which then in turn one can consider, quote, the first cause 
of most of a society's laws, customs, and ideas. Mores in the social state comprise what is chosen by a society, and what is not chosen, the two elements confused together. The consequence is to blur the clear view of the early social contract liberals that politics is best understood as primarily a human choice, one made to escape the state of nature, which is not chosen by us. Exploring the reason for this, we note that Tocqueville declares in the introduction to Democracy in America that democracy is a providential fact. It is a trend that began 700 years ago, 700 years before he was writing, and that only in his time has come to view as providential in the one country, America, that has adopted it and applied it fully and successfully. To call it providential means to deny that it is a human choice or discovery. For example, that of John Locke, the philosopher who inspired the Declaration of Independence. Instead of Locke and the Declaration, Tocqueville begins with the Puritans. The Puritans indeed came to America with an idea. Quote, they wanted to make an idea triumph. But it was a religious and Christian idea for which they called themselves pilgrims. Yet the religious doctrine was blended with, quote, the most absolute democratic and republican theories. And these, not merely of equality, but also of self-government and public education, both of which were put into practice by the Puritans. In place of liberalism and its deistic or atheistic foundation in the, in the state of nature, Tocqueville says the Puritans their religious idea together with their practices. It was they who first brought democracy into broad daylight, au grand jour, he likes to say. Not as a foundation, but active and complete as a way of life. They not merely offered an idea, but also were able to live by it, transforming it into the mores of a social state that could be considered the first cause of American democracy. This much said on behalf of the Puritans, however, Tocqueville goes on to criticize them gently and without Puritan severity, but profoundly. They were, after all, puritanical in their ardor for regulation and their, and their narrow spirit of sect to legislate against sin with abundant resort to penalties of death. Their excesses had to be corrected and they were corrected in what has been called Tocqueville's second founding at the time of the American Revolution, when many states abandoned the establishment of religion in favor of the separation of church and state. The point of departure needed to be departed from, and it is replaced by the principle or dogma of the sovereignty of the people. Not wishing to offend religion or praise its enemies, Tocqueville does not mention its disestablishment. He only says strangely that according to this new sovereignty quote, the people reign over the American political world as God does over the universe, as if somehow the people who were like God had replaced God. For all Tocqueville says in support of the alliance between religion and liberty in the United States, the people have no authority about themselves. They set an authority above themselves when they establish the Constitution, yet do not retain the power to unseat God as they do the Constitution. Indeed, quote, what makes a people master of itself if it has not submitted to God? A people like an individual person makes itself more powerful, not less, with self-restraint. The American people turn religion from an external to an internal restraint. Since religion has its influence in America through mores, it works more indirectly than directly. Even when considering religion, quote, from a purely human point of view, it has an unfailing source of strength in human nature. Quote, the desire for immortality that torments the hearts of all men equally. 
When founded on this desire, religions can aim at universality. But when they become united with government, they apply only to certain peoples. Religion should avoid attaching itself to earthly authority and forswear all reliance on divine right, using mores to regulate democracy rather than rely on laws as much as did the Puritans. Religion is more powerful if it is pure, and it is pure only if it avoids earthly attachments. Paradoxically, religion is more powerful politically if it stays out of politics, if it does not appear as an authority in its own regard, but under cover of the mores that the people practice and hold to. These are Tocqueville's formulations. Yet ever careful as he is to deprecate the role of philosophy and of the philosopher, he presents them as opinions of Americans, not of his own. The paradox of greater power for religion and politics with less involvement is the perception, he reports, of American priests. Not that they have much choice. They perceive that the majority wants them to stay out of politics. There is another power with whom American clergy share their indirect influence, and that is American women. Religion, he says, does little to restrain the American man from his ardor for self-enrichment, but it, quote, reigns as a sovereign over the soul of woman, and it is woman who makes mores. It was a commonplace of the philosophe that credulous women were willing victims of the man manipulation of superstition by the clergy. But when we consult Tocqueville, we find a contrary statement. He says that Americans give girls an education in reason as well as religion, and that they resort to religion for defense of their virtue only when, quote, they have reached the last limits of human force. American women are not weak and credulous. They, quote, display a manly reason and a wholly virile in energy, yet, quote, always remain women in their manners. Here is with the clergy, one may suspect that Tocqueville's description is idealized, and that it masks a recommendation he would prefer not to give outright. He is as modest and as manly as the American women he pictures. It would not have surprised him, however, that in our time women have chosen to be manly and have abandoned the defense, if not the practice, of modesty. In the second volume, of democracy in America, Tocqueville turns to the question of the truth of religion, as opposed to, or in addition to, its usefulness. His approach to the question is still through the usefulness of religion, but now we get a better view of just how it is useful and why American democracy has a stake in its truth. We also see better why he distrusts ideas and why philosophy needs to be concealed under religion. Religion is useful mainly because it hinders the taste for material enjoyments that is endemic to American democracy, indeed in modern democracy as such. Religion is of course a break on licentious liberty <clears throat> and on the sovereignty of the democratic majority. It opposes, quote, the maxim that everything is permitted in the interest of society, an impious maxim, Tocqueville says, that seems to have been invented in the century of freedom to legitimate all the tyrants to come. Yet the true danger is not in the occasional, occasional viciousness of democracy, but in the mediocrity of soul it produces in law-abiding citizens through the taste for material pleasures this taste is surely bourgeois, but it comes from democracy, not from what we call capitalism. When all are equal, no one has natural authority over anyone else. And when a democratic citizen looks for a guide to life, he finds no superior in whom to trust and ends his search by looking to himself. To him, 
There is no distant goal in life to which he can devote himself. For everything beyond the immediate is vague and beyond his ken. The only evident goods to him are palpable and available, material goods. And he devotes himself to goods that he and everyone like him is similars to some love. An, an important notion in Tokyo. Can appreciate. Religion, however, is a form of hope in human nature. Its most important practical teaching is that man has an immortal soul, which is therefore divine. And man's natural hope is that he will live forever. To have an immortal soul is a possession of inestimable value to the perfection of which one can devote one's life. Yet it is also universal and equal, hence democratic. It's perfection, not a goal of aristocratic honor that sets one above others. As a form of hope, religion is not primarily a form of fear, except insofar as one fears one's hope for salvation may be dashed. As the early liberal theorists, particularly Thomas Hobbes, supposed, the fear of invisible spirits and hobbes and the uneasiness of the self in luck turn one's attention to the present. Hope appeals to the future. In the future lies accomplishment in which one can take pride. The early liberals believed human pride to be the source of trouble, especially the prideful notion that human beings are special in the universe because of their immortal souls. This claim, which is so easy to make in general and so hard to specify in particular, leads easily to the tyranny of religion or to the miseries of civil war. But for Tocqueville, the reliance on worldly passions such as fear and material gain produces abject souls more fit for despotism than for liberty. And the weaknesses of democracy are rather stability and stagnation than anarchy and rebelliousness. So for him, religion promotes liberty by teaching men that they are special and that they deserve to take pride in their accomplishments. His most significant apparent departure from Christianity is from Christian humility. It is in regard to pride that he says with apparently conflicting import that religion is, quote, the most precious in inheritance from aristocratic centuries, and yet that religion warms the hearth of patriotism in America. The pride constituting the specialness of man emerges in Tocqueville's consistence with the greatness of man. He seeks to rally, quote, the true friends of liberty and human greatness, and he puts the two together because liberty mired in mediocrity brings on the new sort of despotism he identifies at the end of democracy in America, mild despotism, despotism, Mediocre souls trapped in material enjoyments will readily trade their political liberty for peace and security in those enjoyments. Such people suffer from the new democratic ill he identifies as individualism that occurs when democratic citizens believe and feel themselves to be passive victims of large, impersonal, historical forces they cannot control or influence. In reaction, they withdraw from the public, forgetting they are citizens, and concentrate their lives on family, friends, and themselves. Losing sight of the public, they become oblivious to any distant goal and welcome the benevolent aid of big government, the immense deity that acts on their behalf with their passive consent because it knows better and offers to take over responsibility, rebuild this responsibility for the, quote, trouble of thinking and the pain of living, Tocqueville says sarcastically. Thus, the only true liberty is political liberty in which the goal and the result may sometimes be greatness, but the activity of which always exercises the soul. He remarks on the Americans' veneration for Plymouth Rock, a piece of matter that matters to them. 
Well, does this not show very clearly that the power and greatness of man are wholly in his soul? Religion provides a confirmation that men are not mere pawns of fate or of chance forces, hostile or indifferent to them. It is a guarantee of greatness in human spirituality as it connects men to God. Religion combats the short-sightedness and fecklessness of democracy and gives it something to be proud of above the mediocrity of material enjoyments. When this mediocrity appears as the main enemy of democracy through the erosion of political liberty, we come upon the baleful influence of democratic ideas. We begin to appreciate the reason why Tocqueville is so suspicious of philosophy. What he often simply calls doubt as characteristic of democratic agents is philosophic doubt of religion that issues in the suspension of belief or in practice when suspension is no longer possible in denial of belief in materialism. The doubt in question amounts to a denial of the human soul and in consequence of human agency as we say today. The spiritual, not the material, is what is doubted. Though in modern mathematical physics, it turns out not to be easy to define or grasp what matter is. In the early liberalism, Tocqueville rejects, men are liberated from prejudice and superstition only to be enthralled to the worldly passions of fear and gain. They are conquered or bullied into promising obedience in Hobbes' theory or, quote, quickly driven into society in Locke's words, rather than freely choosing to do so. The model for liberty is the abstract, pre-political state of nature, which is positive and may or may not exist, rather than the model of political liberty existing in practice that Tocqueville finds in the township of New England. Early liberalism is apolitical, it supports politics with non-political motives, and it betrays the goal of liberty with a passive and slavish means it specifies for achieving liberty. This is not liberalism with soul, like Tocqueville's, because it degrades souls by overwhelming them with fear and seducing them with incentives for material gain. It is not a liberalism that can sustain liberty. Materialism teaches democratic peoples that they have nothing special in them to be proud of. And in the form of the scientific determinism, powerful in Tocqueville's time and still in ours, that they are incapable of avoiding the fate that chance decrees and science uncovers and displays for all to see. But since pride is in human nature, Materialists, materialists are unable to avoid taking pride in themselves. Their system might be useful if it gave them and taught others to take a modest idea of oneself. All of us, including Nobel Prize winners, being matter of little account. But they do not, in fact, draw or expound this lesson. When they believe they have proof that men are no better than brutes, Tocqueville says, they are as proud as if they had demonstrated they were gods. The scientific materialism that deprives citizens of their belief in the possibility of self-government is used to justify, instead, the rational control of citizens by experts with knowledge of that science. The danger of materialist ideas in our democratic age is responsible for Tocqueville's leery distrust of philosophical ideas and for his selective trust in religious ideas. As we shall see, the religious ideas he presents have more to do with philosophy than with revelation. He approves of certain philosophical ideas, those advancing spiritualism, but without much discrimination. He would rather you believe that your soul can migrate to the body of a pig than that you have no soul. He reserves his approval for whatever spiritual doctrine emerges from philosophy and criticizes the usual effects of philosophical inquiry in democracy. 
Philosophical inquiry begins with doubt. But instead of truly doubting, people taught to doubt merely doubt the authority of others and then turn to themselves and their own authority. That is why he treats Descartes, the philosopher of doubt, as a teacher of democracy, a perceptive estimation one will not find in textbooks. When Cartesian doubt is generalized and transferred from philosopher to citizen, the result is a democratic dogma that each individual has sufficient reason to run his own life. So Descartes' thought is most perfectly realized in America, where nobody has read him because nobody needs to read him, where doubt of dogmatic authority has become the dogmatic authority of doubt. In the modern age, the democratic propensity for material well-being, with its mediocrity, its individualism, and its mild despotism, renders philosophical materialism dangerous, and all philosophy dubious, because in that age, philosophy is likely to be materialist. The debate over foundations in liberalism today is between those who insist on philosophical foundations of liberty, so as to ex exclude illiberal notions of virtue and salvation that are harmful and hostile to liberty. And, on the other hand, those who argue that such foundations are an infringement of liberty, and in any case difficult to prove and to gain consent for. Tocqueville stands on either side of this debate, but in a middle position of his own. Though opposed to philosophical foundations, he holds that America has and needs foundations in religious faith in order to keep its democratic liberty. As to philosophy, Tocqueville says, quote, Americans have not needed to draw their philosophical method from books. They found it in themselves. And as to religion, quote, men have an immense interest in making very fixed ideas for themselves about God, their souls, their general duties. In the first quotation, we see Tocqueville rejecting the bookish influence of philosophers in favor of actual practice where citizens manage to make their way forward without the guide of a foundation prescribed by philosophy. In the second quotation, however, we see the need stated for, quote, very fixed ideas that do not arise from practice, but precede and guide practice. These ideas must come from religion rather than philosophy. Any society, and especially a democratic one, must take account of what most people think. And most people have recourse to the dogmas of religion for guidance because they have neither the time nor the capacity for philosophizing. Even if they did or could philosophize, they would find that through the ages, philosophers, quote, despite all their efforts, have been able to discover only a few contradictory notions. Those who try to rely on philosophy for the fixed ideas they need in their ordinary lives, Tocqueville says, do not find them but come to grief and doubt. Quote, doubt takes hold of the highest portions of the intellect and half paralyzes all the others. Each person becomes accustomed to hearing confused and changing opinions on matters of most interest to himself and people like him, vaguely troubling issues of the day, in which it is hard to follow the arguments. Abortion, say. We throw up our hands, feeling defeated, and in cowardly fashion, we refuse to think. If people will not think, doubt cannot fail to enervate souls, thereby threatening the maintenance of, the maintenance of liberty, because enervated souls will not take the trouble to exercise liberty or defend it. Thus, one of his most memorable phrases, I am brought to think that if a man has no faith, he must serve, and if he is free, he must believe. Here is a liberal rejecting liberal foundations in philosophy, yet requiring them in religion. But his statement against doubt blames it for preventing people from thinking, that is, from thinking practically and usefully. 
Philosophical thinking leads to paralysis of practical thinking, in which overmatched would-be philosophers are led ultimately to passive acceptance of things as they are. Philosophy may begin from the questioning of authority, but when it appears that all the questioning leads to no answers, it stops and finds rest in the conclusion that nothing can be done. Faith, then, is not a substitute for reasoning simply, but only for philosophical reasoning. It clears the way and is actually the basis for reasoning about one's closest interests. Tocqueville says that religion imposes a salutary yoke on the intellect by preventing the use of individual reason to raise doubt and by establishing general ideas about God and human nature that permit men to recognize an authority. Reason as philosophy gets in the way of reason as practice because the one attacks authority and the other requires it. Now, what is the solution? Is it merely to declare that the two aspects of reason are antithetical, and that practice being more important than philosophy, the need for active practice must dominate the pleasure, if it is a pleasure, of speculating, and dogma must silence philosophy? Tocqueville does not adopt that solution, though he may appear to do so because sometimes he seems to criticize all philosophy, philosophy itself. But he also shows appreciation for the contemplative life of the philosopher, praising the, quote, ardent, haughty, and disinterested love of true one finds in Pascal, and the lofty contempt for practice as vile, low, and mercenary in Archimedes, while distinguishing the science of the most theoretical principles that may flourish in aristocracy from science devoted to applications in practice characteristic of democracy. It is a weakness of democracy that it does not encourage, quote, the contemplation of first causes. Tocqueville himself warns his readers that he feels, quote, obliged to push each of his ideas to all its theoretical consequences. And he does not hesitate to speak fairly frequently of first causes. Religion, then, does not replace philosophy or science but it serves as their public face and supplies the fixed ideas that men need to live in freedom. Servility of the soul is not the consequence of religion, as the philosophers asserted, but of anti-religious materialism, which denies the soul by demeaning man into matter, or abases the soul by endorsing the democratic propensity to a life of material well-being. At the end of Democracy in America, Tocqueville dis discloses something of the character of the religion he recommends. It is not just any religion, as he seemed to imply earlier when speaking of religion as part of democratic morals, but a reasonable religion that confirms the intelligibility of nature and of the world. In his own name, he strives, like a philosopher, like the youthful Pascal, but with a view to the intelligible, to enter into the comprehensive point of view of God in regard to democracy and aristocracy. God is approachable to man through his mind. Although Tocqueville speaks here of, as it were, two humanities, the one of aristocracy and the other of democracy, thus apparently distinguishing them profoundly he also justifies the comparisons he has made continuously throughout the book by referring them to one superhuman whole in which they are joined. God, in quotes, is apparently a person and clearly distinct from his creation. Tocqueville does not insist on the difference between revealed and natural or rational religion, and he had declared that, quote, it was necessary that Jesus Christ come to earth to make it understood that all members of the human species are naturally alike and equal. Revealed truth is distinct from the truth of nature, but revelation makes nature apparent to us 
in a way unassisted human reason cannot. Here, revelation was an aid to nature and not a distinct force from it. Philosophy is then under a duty not to overlook the difference between itself and revelation, but also not to present it in a way hostile to the latter. The order that Tocco sees in or imputes to God's mind leaves untouched the statements of God's hidden character in scripture without contradicting them. Religion understood as the order of God's mind repels, quote, two false and cowardly doctrines. What are they? We see them in what he says of providence. Providence has not created the human race either entirely independent or perfectly slave. The first is the aristocratic criticism of democracy that, is, that it is anarchic. The second is the democratic idea that peoples ne quote, necessarily obey I do not know which insurmountable and unintelligent force born of previous events, the race, the soil, or the climate. Strangely, both of these may be found in liberal social contract theories. The first in the state of nature, in which men are anarchic and at war. The second, in the means for escaping the state of nature, which play on fear and subject men, quote, to insurmountable and unintelligent force, consisting variously of laws or rules of subrational motivation discovered by history and social science. As opposed to these, religion can cement its alliance with liberty and with reason, all three together in the politics of democracy. The two contraries of entirely independent and perfectly slave stand for the two aspects of chance, unpredictability and subjection. Together, chance, fate, to which religion is opposed. Religion, as Tocqueville portrays it, tries to make our life predictable, but not so predictable that we can succeed without trying. And it sets limits to our intellect, our freedom, and our choice, but not such narrow limits that we can never succeed no matter how hard we try. The task of politics, which Tocqueville sometimes calls, in the manner of Plato and Aristotle, the task of the legislator is to cooperate with religion and to guide our lives so that our virtue is rewarded and our freedom preserved. Now, the most fundamental democratic idea, as we learned from Aristotle, is that of the lottery. It is a system to which a decision is arrived at without a choice, in which everyone without discrimination has an equal chance. No reason is exercised in making the decision, and none is found in the result. No freedom exists. One simply receives what happens. No virtue is required, and none is rewarded or expected. Opposite to a lottery is voting, which is making a choice, and is aristocratic because one chooses for what one thinks is best. Still, according to Aristotle, we moderns think that voting is the clearest sign of democracy, but we forget the aristocracy necessarily mixed in democracy. Even to institute a lottery requires choice, thought, and freedom, all items opposed to lottery, which is democracy in its raw, basic sense of mere chance. The legislator in the singular, in Tocqueville, has an art or science, or theories, or genius that is above democracy. Like God's mind, and like Tocqueville himself, it sees both the similarities and the differences of human beings, while recognizing that either democracy or aristocracy must be chosen as a whole, a whole that is partial in respect to the unseen whole of God's mind. Thus, the legislator combines the, as it were, two distinct humanities that Tocqueville makes available to his readers through his frequent and always illuminating contrasts 
of democracy and meritocracy. Is political science is necessarily left scattered and uncollected because it cannot be set forth separately from its context in American politics in the form of a model without becoming excessively schematic, thus doing violence to its basis and practice. A schematic political science risks forgetting its basis in practice and claiming a false impartiality above practice, like our democratic theory today, which loses sight of the fact that democracy is not the whole of politics, but a partial whole within the whole of politics. Our democratic theory is both less detailed and more parochial than Tocqueville's understanding. Although being a democratic citizen is quite different from being the legislator, Tocqueville's political science gives us an awareness of the connection between the two. To the task of the legislator, our religion contributes, quote, certain fixed ideas, which though fixed are not arbitrary, not unreasonable, not really positive because we need them. The power that men must obey is not chance, or does not have to be chance. It permits peoples to be masters of themselves if they take the legislator's wisdom to heart. Thereby, the democratic dogma that each has sufficient reason to guide himself would be justified as a democratic principle in a chapter where um, Tocqueville discusses the sovereignty of the people. He speaks of it both as a dogma and as a principle. The intelligence of the legislator meeting the intelligibility of God's creation and communicated to the democratic citizen. It is then the task of citizens to make their accomplishments worthy of reasonable pride. Tocqueville does not have the legislator make up a religion like Rousseau, or even propose that he revise an existing one like Hobbes and Locke. The legislator works through American legislators, in the plural, who accommodate the existing religion that Providence has supplied. By his multicultural analysis, the best religion for the protection and fostering of democratic liberty is Christianity but with apparent conditions, that it stay out of politics and compromise Christian humility. Thanks, I'm not.